some of the things I really liked about his book, same as ever, is like he talks about how the biggest risk is what nobody sees coming. Your risk is what you don't see. So, you know, it's an important reminder, I think, to account for things in life where things are going to happen that you just can't even imagine. Like, I wanted to start off just talking a little bit about your journey into value investing and wanting to know, like, when did money, finance, investing just come online for you as an interest? Yeah. So growing up, I'd say I had an amazing family, fantastic upbringing, but uh, I really wasn't ever taught about money or investing growing up. I remember one of my teachers in school uh, mentioned the penny doubling for 30 days example and, you know, to help illustrate the power of compounding. But I don't think that message really got across in that you know, this is a way you can invest or this is a way you can actually grow your money, grow your wealth. So I do recall that, but I don't really recall anything ever uh, growing up uh, of, you know, having investors around me or people talk about it. Um, somehow I happened to come across a Buffett biography when I was age 18. And that's when it started to click for me where this guy just sits in his office every day and is making a bunch of money doing it somehow. <laughs> right. So that's when I kind of got the interest in investing. Um, <clears throat> in college, I kind of went down like the personal development sort of path, like uh -huh. get Robert Kiyosaki's book, yep. uh, get the, the compound, I think it was the compound effect and like the power of habit, oh, yeah. books like that, atomic habits mm -hmm. and yep. all those sorts of books. And then one day I must have just Googled uh, investing podcasts and then come across TIP's content. And uh, that was kind of a tool I added to my toolkit of, you know, commutes, just tune on, turn on the podcast, make my commutes more productive and uh, just utilize my time better. And I, I just, you know, I checked out obviously a bunch of investing podcasts, but it, I just really enjoyed learning from Preston and Stig because they just seemed to make investing much more approachable, seemed to make a ton of sense to me. And even if I didn't end up buying a lot of the stocks they talked about, I enjoyed just learning about their thought process of how they thought about things. Uh, what do they look for? What's the red flags they look for? So, you know, there's so much nuance in investing, you know, what you don't know what you don't know. And mm -hmm. I think that's just something uh, people really enjoy uh, with TIP's content and what we do. And I'd say my learning journey really uh, went to hyperdrive when I, join TIP because I was just forced to learn if I was going to be uh, recording with these great guests, I better know what the heck I'm talking about. And um, yeah, over time, we've just found a strategy that I feel like has worked for me, makes a lot of sense to me. And then uh, prior to that, I was, uh, you know, mainly interested in just index funds and uh, safer type investments that I knew I could sleep well at night owning. That's cool. So you're 18. You're in college at this point and it's a Warren Buffett book. Do you remember which one it was that like you were yeah. reading at that time? The Snowball. Snowball by Alice Schroeder is I think is yeah. the author. Yeah, yep. that's a fantastic book. That's one that's I remember reading it too. I forget when it whatever it came out, maybe 2014 or 15. I can't remember, but it's a page turner. It's like something you you can't put down. And funny enough, uh I just now sort of realized this. My first two episodes on We Study Billionaires, I did a deep dive on the snowball by, by Alex Schroeder. So uh, awesome. it kind of came full, full circle when I joined We Study Billionaires. That's cool. So you're 18, you're starting this, you know, reading Buffett, you're doing some self-development. What, what did you study and what um, just kind of how did your career progress from like, you know, 18 onwards? Yeah, so in high school, I knew... Uh, I had no idea what I wanted to do for a living, yeah. but I knew that I was pretty good at math or at least above average. And uh, <laughs> the University of Nebraska has a, it's an actuarial science program or for shorthand, just people just say actuary program. And essentially actuaries are like the math brains behind insurance companies. And the mm -hmm. interesting thing about insurance companies is they sell products to people that they have no idea how much it's going to cost them. When Coca-Cola sells you a can of Coke, 
you know, or they yeah. know how much it costs them to produce that can of Coke. But when you buy a auto insurance policy from Geico, uh, Geico has no idea how much it's going to cost them to uh, sell you that policy. And, you know, you, January 1st, you buy it over the year. You don't know if you're going to get in a car accident, if you're going to have these major expenses. So that's one of the interesting things about uh, the insurance field is how the math sort of plays into this. And I thought that would suit me well. Um, I was also, I also thought I'd be pretty interested in business. Um, just learning about uh, businesses and there was plenty of finance classes within uh, that curriculum. So I went to University of Nebraska for four years. Um, didn't really know if I wanted to do that um, over the long run. And one of the things I liked about it is it's a pretty dang good career. Mm -hmm with the level of education you need, you need to get. So you get your undergrad and then you take these exams after. It's not like you need to go and do like four years of grad school like many other uh, great fields or go and, right. you know, 10, 10 plus years of school to go and become a doctor. Like I feel like it's so hard to pivot from something like that. And um, I feel like I didn't really want to corner myself in, in a field and, you know, the sunk cost of I think so many people find themselves in. So I'm really happy I sort of went that direction where I gave myself the optionality. Hey, if this, does, this doesn't work out, if I want to go become a podcast host or whatever, then uh, we can make it work. So I was an actuary for four years. I worked at a smaller consulting company in Omaha for a few years. And then I uh, switched jobs, moved back to uh, Lincoln, where I'm based now, and worked for an insurance company. And I just decided that, you know, that's that field and just kind of the corporate life didn't really suit my personality or when I, what I wanted to do long term. And then I developed this interest on the side of TIP stuff, learning all about investing. And I thought the investing field was something uh, I, I would enjoy doing. It, ju it, it was uh, just difficult to figure out what exactly that was. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems I think I found was just the incentive structure within so many jobs mm -hmm. is just like not well aligned. For example, uh, a lot of these uh, investment advisor positions, you know, incentivize you to sell products or sell, sell yep. you know, sell products rather than uh, doing what's in the best interest of the clients. So that's one part I found sort of difficult to navigate. And then, um, yeah, then eventually transitioned to join TIP and just found the right opportunity that uh, I felt might work. And it was in the investment industry. And then uh, here we are. Yeah. So I want to take a step back. So you, you graduate, you're in actuarial science, you've got a good starting salary. You're starting to be able to invest. I, I imagine in college, you didn't have a whole lot to invest, even though you, you might've been studying some of the principles at that point, when you started to have a little bit of income and, and, you know, money to save, what, what were some of your first steps? Like, were you, were you an index fund investor? Were you picking your own stocks at that point? Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, overall, generally index funds. Uh, one of the most useful books, I think, uh, people that are just sort of getting into investing or wrapping their minds around why it's important is uh, J.L. Collins' book, The Simple Path to Wealth. Uh, it's a fantastic yeah. book. And it just explains why index funds work and why like mm -hmm. most people should be buying index funds. I completely agree with that advice. But um, yeah, there's just... Uh, there's so many people out there that uh, need to scratch their investing itch and they just get into the value investing space and they get into what TIP talks about and you just really can't get enough of it. And that, I felt like right. I was that kind of person where I just loved studying businesses. I loved taking a more active approach, knowing that, you know, I might underperform if, you know, I don't make uh, the right investment decisions or yeah. And I just kind of accepted that. And, um, yeah, as you mentioned, not a lot of money invested in college. And then uh, after college, definitely started earning a, a pretty decent salary and then saving money. And then, yeah, a lot of that went to index funds and then uh, at just allocated a smaller portion of my portfolio to uh, individual stocks, you know, kind of to scratch that investing itch. And sure. I think the biggest thing was just um, using them as, as learning experiences, you know, obviously make money, lose money on some. Yeah. and uh, you know, one of my early lessons was I just happened to buy Apple when I was in college. 
And that that investment ended up really working really, really well. But then there's another investment that essentially went to zero. And then I yeah. realized from that that sort of experience that uh my winners far outweighed my losers, where I like I allocated like a similar position size to both of them. And then uh-huh. Apple goes up four or five X and then the other one goes to zero. So it doesn't does it didn't really matter. Still end up with a really fine result. And yep. uh it's actually a point got them made made on our show where compounding is convex to the upside and concave to the to the downside, meaning that over time the gains can far outweigh the losses, assuming that you pick up some really great companies. So yeah, yeah uh obviously made a lot of mistakes along the way. And uh it's so funny that um you know you're early on when you're just starting out, you're like don't really know what you're doing. And uh those those experiences really teach you a lot and uh really carry with you uh for the rest of your life so you're four or five years as an actuary right at at what point did you start getting this itch of like i want to explore something else i don't think this is the right career path for me i want to hear about just the that transition f- from working as an actuary to starting to have a thought process of exploring other options and then just how TIP came about. Yeah. So I mentioned my first job was a consulting role and that was with a smaller company. And what I liked about that was it being a smaller company. So I could work on a wide variety of projects. I kind of have some flexibility on what I'm going to work on. And then, um, in a smaller company, your ability to move up, uh, is really enhanced. Whereas with a corporate job, you're kind of stuck in your role. You do what you're told yeah. and you only move up after a certain number of years or the right opportunity comes up. So after that first job, I transferred to an insurance role. Um, it wasn't a massive company, but it was still like kind of your traditional corporate sure. uh, job. And yeah, ever since I transitioned there, that was fall of 2020. Um, I realized like, yeah, I need to try and find something else. But it's not like it was the end of the world. Like I was making a great salary. I'd got my uh, associate designation for that field, uh, Mm -hmm. which, you know, gave me a pretty decent, decent pay bump. And then, um, yeah, I mean, like I was um, just enjoying listening to like TIP stuff. And I remember I was on vacation actually with my family. We were down at the Lake, the Ozarks, and Mm -hmm. I got an email from Robert Leonard. Apparently I was on TIP's email list and Robert said that, uh, you know, he just sent an email out to the whole list saying, hey, we're hiring for our millennial investing show. If you want to work from home, set your own schedule, be a podcast host with TIP, uh, you can apply here. And Mm -hmm. since I was on vacation, I didn't really think too much about it. I was like, "Eh, I could never be a podcast host. Like if if you know any actuaries, you know that they're like the most (laughs) introverted people (laughs) you'll ever meet or some of them can be pretty socially awkward. But uh but um, one of my friends that also listened to TIP, he texted me. He's like, you, sh- you should apply for that role. And I was mm-hmm. like, you know what? Maybe I should. <laughs> so I threw my hat in the ring thinking there's no way I'm going to be getting this, this job. Right. Like there's right. surely they're going to find someone that's plenty more qualified than me. Just someone, you know, no experience podcasting, no experience in the investment arena. And yeah. uh it turns out over a hundred people applied and then I made it to like the final five. Mm-hmm. And that's when, uh, we had a call with Stig right. and, uh, apparently Robert and Stig, uh, both said I was, uh, the right fit for the job. So, um, I think a lot of it was, uh, they saw like how big of a fan of TIP I was. And yeah. like, that's kind of the most important thing is like understanding what TIP is all about. And it's not mm-hmm. so much about, you know, knowing everything about value investing and what makes a great investment. Like a lot of that stuff is learnable, but like the, the soft skills and the, the culture fit is a thing that, uh, you really can't fix, you know, you know, you really need to get it right from the beginning. Right. That's awesome. I love hearing that story. Uh, similar experience for me, just, you know, hearing that they were advertising for a newsletter position. I, I thought the same thing. I'm like, uh, I doubt I'll get this, but I'm going to apply because I love TIP and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> and so, yeah. and it's just like you said, it's a small company. So there's lots of room for development and improvement and, and things like that, different movements within the company. But um, 
I, I wanted to hear a little bit. Um, so I, I wanted to hear how your, just your learning and growth has, has been affected since joining TIP. Like what has changed for you as a person since, since joining uh, and becoming a host of first millennial investing. And now we study billionaires. Yeah. Joining TIP has really changed everything for me. I'm just learning new things all the time, you know, definitely every week. One of your points to me uh, earlier before we hit record is uh, the shiny object syndrome. I've learned to uh, say no to things rather quickly. You know, my e email inbox is just full of people wanting to be on the show or people, uh, you know, sh sharing stock ideas and whatnot. And, um, you know, finding in, uh, an investment style that fits my skill set and my temperament has been really helpful. And it just, you know, helps me be more efficient and uh, bringing, scanning through all these ideas. And I think one of the biggest things uh, being at TIP is um, just help me be more humble. You know, there's a lot of smart people out there with a lot of different uh, ideas and different, you know, uh, thoughts on where the world is sort of heading. And it's sort of led me to this realization that cha things are changing all the time. We can't know everything. So um, what's going well now might be go might go really poorly, really quickly. And even if you know, even if you think you know what will happen in the future, um, I think it's important to be humble enough to know that um, surprises happen all the time. And uh, it's another thing I realized after reading Morgan Housel's recent book. And oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, when you think about it, like the role you and I are in, Patrick, is like we get paid to learn. Mm -hmm. um just learn from people learn from all these books and such and um it just gives me an, an immense amount of gratitude too to just be in this type of position where you know i get to wake up and just learn and get to meet amazing people uh, in the community i help run and um yeah just the learning never ends and you know when we're we're all kind of following the footsteps of like buffett and munger and you know they're learning machines and as they say, the learning really never ends. Yeah. So it's a huge gift. I, I totally agree. It's uh, sometimes I pinch myself that I get to do this and talk to the people that we get to talk to. I wanted to hear a little bit about like when you decided to to leave your career, what was the feedback from some of your coworkers when you told them what, what you were going to be doing? Yeah. The, the feedback from just people in general was, was pretty mixed. Um, uh -huh. Some people were very skeptical you know, thinking you could make any money at all hosting a podcast or right. thinking it would go well, given you have zero podcast experience. Um, more generally, uh, you know, people were, a lot of people just don't listen to podcasts, which is funny enough, yeah. like you and I, the people that are in our circles listen to podcasts right. all the time. So it's kind of these, these uh, two different worlds where people mm -hmm. are like, Oh my gosh, this is like an amazing opportunity. Those who know what TIP is. And then other people are like, what the heck are you doing? Leaving yeah. this like safe job, got all these benefits, you know, you're on a great trajectory. Why would you, you know, let that go? So, uh, you know, it sort of made me realize like what's mo most important to me. Um, mm -hmm. what do I value rather than, you know, what does like other people value or what do other people want to see in me or what do they want me to achieve? So it's uh, been this process of like figuring out what it, what it is that I want, you know, <laughs> right. at the end of the day, it's like uh, deciding what's most important to me. Um, so yeah, the feedback was definitely uh, mixed. Um, you know, looking back, I really appreciate those the people that like really supported me because it, it really was a difficult decision just to like make the jump on my own, but also like overcome some of the feedback that I did receive, uh, from people. Um, yeah, I think a, a lot of people sort of forget about that where they might be listening to the show and be like, Oh, like Clay's got the best job in the world. Like reading all these books, talking with all these people, but, uh, making that jump definitely was uh, pretty difficult. Yeah, I can imagine. I, I mentioned that I, you know, knew about you before you started at TIP through Twitter and you were posting a lot of great content. At what point did you realize that Twitter was this tool that is super powerful and an incredible learning 
place, like to be a learning machine. I wanted to just hear about that, like how, what, how your Twitter philosophy came to be. Yeah, I think I sort of came to a similar realization to Kyle, who I, I listened to your episode with him just recently here on Millennial Investing. And Kyle had mentioned that um, the best way to learn something is to write about it and te teach that subject to others. So when COVID yeah. hit, um, everyone was sent home from the office to work from home. And I just found myself with so much more time. Yeah, so when COVID hit, I just realized that I had all this time on my hands and I was like, okay, what am I going to do with all this time? Like it was like a couple of weeks I started playing video games and it's like, I, I can't just keep doing this. So, right, right. um, what I did was I, I purchased a course on, I don't know if it was like a hundred dollar course on just like how to grow a Twitter following. And mm -hmm. <laughs> so I purchased that and just, I just started, you know, creating content on Twitter and just figure out ways to, um, learn things and start sharing them with others. And really it was just my sort of way to, to spend all this time, um, during COVID and looking back, you know, I wish I would, <laughs> would have, wish I would have spent more time, you know, doing things like reading all these books that I've now discovered since joining TIP instead of, yeah. you know, communicating with all these different accounts on Twitter, but, uh, you know, life's a learning journey and you live and you learn, I guess. Right. Right. So when you first started off with millennial investing, you you know you've had a ton of great guests that that I've listened to, and and you've done a lot of different kinds of podcasts. You've done series and things like that. But I wanted to hear a little about like some of the like guests that you've had on on millennial investing or we study billionaires that have really been like impactful for you, and just some of the takeaways that that uh, you've garnered from them. Yeah, the We Study Billionaires guests are definitely more top of mind. But Millennial Investing, one of the guests I really enjoyed bringing on was Adam Ziesel. Um, mm. His book, Where the Money Is, I thought was yeah. great. It was kind of like a modern day version of um, some of these value investing books that are classics, like The the Intelligent Investor. It's kind of modern day version of uh, you know appreciating things like business quality and such. And uh, his his template to valuing technology companies in today's era, you know, he uses the the prime example is Amazon and how everyone just said they were too expensive, yet the stock goes up 100x or whatever <laughs> from where right. they said it was way too expensive. But uh, Adam Cecil is one of my favorite guests on millennial investing. Mm -hmm. But uh, I remember that one. I actually did a write up in the newsletter uh, after you had interviewed him, kind of highlighting some of the ideas that that he had touched on. Yeah, it was a good one. And actually, I I still email him from time to time. Sometimes I'll yeah. come across businesses, and he's he's looked at a lot of different companies and thought about uh, uh, moats. And um, yeah, he's someone I have kept in touch with over the past couple of years. Just a fantastic guy. Yeah. And then uh, we study billionaires. I mean, uh, I just interviewed Morgan Housel, and he's definitely probably the favorite my favorite guests I've ever had on the show. I'm a big fan of his and really enjoyed having the opportunity to chat with him. And this was the first interview in a while where I felt pretty nervous or pretty anxious since I knew right. we only had 60 minutes to record and we really had to do it in one go. But yeah. uh, some of the things I really liked about his book, same as ever, is like he talks about how the biggest risk is what nobody sees coming or risk is what you don't see. So you know, it's an important reminder, I think, to account for things in life where things are going to happen that you just can't even imagine, like COVID, 9-11, yeah. the 1987 flash crash, the recent wars. I mean, it's just a great reminder that we shouldn't be surprised when things completely unexpected happen. And he has this, he has this saying in this, in this book that it's pretty unsettling that the biggest news story of the next 10 years. So we're in 2024 right now. The biggest sto news story of the next 10 years is going to be something that nobody is talking about today. And right. the reason that is, is because that's the way it's always been. Yep. And another great example he shares in the book is that zero economists forecasted the Great Depression. Is that right? <laughs> and, yeah. And since, uh, 
since nobody forecasted it, nobody expected it, no one was prepared for it. So that's right. that's one of the reasons like it was so bad. And you know, after the great financial crisis and the Fed sort of bailed out the banks, all these people called for hyperinflation and such and you know, rates are going to skyrocket, we're going to see hyperinflation, but we actually saw the exact opposite where uh, rates went, practically went to 0% and inflation in the real economy at least didn't really show up. So, you know, just it was really humbling reading that book and reading about, you know, these these forecasters. And uh, there's a couple other things I, I thought were uh, worth mentioning here in regards to Morgan's book. He has this chapter on competitive advantages. It was mm -hmm. the chapter is titled Keep Running. And he ties in all these interesting biological uh, sort of lessons where biology encourages like all these species to grow and then mm -hmm. Uh, biology punishes you for being big. So right. I thought that was quite interesting how he ties that into companies. There's a statistic he shared where 40% of all public companies lost their value from 1980 to 2014. So through that period, 40% of public companies. How do you get started with stock investing? I've put together a course to teach you everything I wish I knew when I first started investing in stocks. Let's start at the beginning and ask, what is a stock? Let's zoom on in into what it's actually like to buy a stock. A few options are Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, Ally, E-Trade. Fortunately, you won't have to necessarily calculate all of these taxes yourself. I'll outline a few main ones to be aware of throughout your lifetime investing journey. As Warren Buffett says, your best investment is yourself. There's nothing that compares to it. By the end, you'll be savvier about stock investing and personal finance than the vast majority of people. Even if you're not a total beginner, I'm confident you'll get a lot out of the principles and strategies I outline, which we'll build on throughout. A link to the course is available in the description below. See you there. Uh, ended up going to zero. Right. And you know, it's again, it's just very humbling in that uh, most companies are doomed uh, to die. I also wanted to mention that uh, I, I I interviewed Chris Mayer twice in 2023. He was probably one of my other favorite guests, and I'm actually chatting with him again next week. And his book uh, titled "How Do You Know" uh, was probably one of the best books I read personally in 2023. And I know a lot of people probably haven't read that book, and it just taught yeah, me. Yeah, I've like, not read it yet. I've not read either the Morgan. I wanted it. Morgan Housel was called "Same as Ever," correct? That's his right. second book psychology yep. of money was his first and then chris Mayer, his first book is hundred baggers right yeah and he has what's a handful the second of books actually he has he a does? handful okay. of books so he he wrote uh a, a couple others uh i i personally didn't find quite as quite as interesting but a hundred baggers i 100 percent recommend i've i've read that book a handful of times and then yep. yeah how do you know it's a book about general semantics, which is like a philosophical sort of yeah. thing. But he takes all these philosophical ideas and applies it to investing. And uh, def that we we talked about that book on the show, and it was uh, one of my favorite interviews. Is it kind of a heady philosophical book? Because I think general semantics, I know a little bit about it, um, but not mm -hmm. not much. So is it more of a philosophical look at, yeah, at so, investing? Yeah, it's definitely more of a f philosophical book to help paint a picture for what the book's about. Kind of the the, the key kind of quote I sort of think of when I think of that book is the map is not the territory. Yeah. yeah. So people like to use these words to explain something, but mm -hmm. using these words, they aren't really explaining or they aren't, they don't really mean anything with what they're saying. So... Right. It really made me wary of labels, labels mm -hmm. like growth stocks, value stocks, the yeah. economy, GDP, all these big, broad terms. People use these terms of, as if they mean something. But uh, I think it's just it just points to a lot of people oversimplify investing and oversimplify the world. And uh, I think there's one example I remember from the book that you'd probably appreciate is sometimes investors will value a company based on like the real estate they own. So this mm -hmm. company has say 10,000 acres in Florida and all these other states. And then they yeah. just they just pluck a value on each each of these uh you know properties in 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 all these states. So like the properties in Florida, they might say it's worth 
however many dollars per square foot. And they just like simplify, this is how much the Florida real estate is. But, but in reality, like some of it's like very valuable. Some of it's not mm-hmm. so valuable. So uh, I think that was a great case in his book where investors can get themselves into trouble by um, taking these shortcuts and oversimplifying. Obviously, we have to take some sort of sor- shortcuts because we can't know. It, it's impossible to know everything is the trick. Yeah, so sure. he just really opened my eyes to uh, how these terms can really dupe, dupe people. And well, an, even another... like in value investing, I was just thinking that, you know, when you, you can use the word value investing and people think we're all on the same page on that. Exactly. But what Adam Cecil thinks about value investing and what Warren Buffett thinks about value investing are two different things. Exactly. There might be some similar you... concepts, but like, they're not you could on have the someone page. that's like a cigar butt investor where they only yeah. buy things below liquidation value. And then you have someone that pays uh, for a company like Constellation Software 35 times their earnings and say they're a value investor. So right. uh, grouping these two people under the same term really doesn't tell you anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So the map is not the territory. That's a, I like that quote. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about you know, I wanted to say you're on a flight from, from Nebraska to New York, right. And you've got the opportunity to, to sit with whatever, a handful of, of investors that have inspired you, who would those people be living or dead? I mean, maybe not Buffett and Munger, because obviously they've inspired us both, but, but, uh, some other ones. Yeah. The first, I've, I've already mentioned him and interviewed him twice, but Chris Mayer would probably be on one side of me. I'll, I'll pick like a middle seat so I have two people next to me. Okay. <laughs> um, so Chris Mayer, I'd probably put next to me. One reason is uh, I picked up a number of his holdings that he has in his portfolio. So I'd love to pick his brain on that. And I know he's looked at a ton of companies. So I, I know there's stuff that, uh, you know, might be interesting. It might be more interesting to me because it's a smaller name and it might not fit into his fund because he need he probably needs to, you know, not be a micro micro cap investor <laughs> essentially. Right. So right. I know he's looked at a lot of interesting uh, companies. And now I know you just did a, a segment on Copart. Is Copart something that he follows and is into? Yeah, he's owned it for a while. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's what and, I thought. And what's also interesting about Chris is he's he wrote a newsletter and like traveled all over the world and he's been to all different, I don't know how many countries he's been to, but it's a lot. And I'm sure he'd have some amazing stories to share and just recommendations on places to go. And, um, he's done a lot of boots on the ground, like travel, you know, searching and researching investments. Yeah. Right. It's good stuff. And then on my left side, uh, in the theoretical plane, I'd probably want Monish Pabrai there. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. He, he's another person where I'm, he's just full of ideas. He's just, have you had a chance to interview Monish yet? No, not yet. Um, yeah, I just admire his ability to look for things and places where no one's really looking. I think Turkey is a good example of that. And, um, he, I just think he'd be a great person in terms of idea generation and finding things you couldn't even dream that existed. Right. Right. He's got some, he's got a great book that I love, uh, the Dondo investor. And, uh, he's in the William Green's book, richer, wiser, happier. He's the, he's the first investor focus. The first chapter is about Monish. And I remember listening to, to William's book on a plane once. And I love richer, wiser, happier. I think that book is just like a wealth of wisdom in that one. But yeah, I just remember listening to so many of the stories about Monish and he's such a fascinating character, I think. Yeah. And yeah, I, I really like his sort of approach where there's a lot of value investors where they buy a decent business they think is like 10 or 20% below intrinsic value. But Monish, he, he's talking about a company that's like 96% discount to liquidation value. <laughs> like, yeah, he just finds these things that like no one's talking about or no one's even looking at. And um, like you said, just a very interesting guy. And there's one point that really stuck with me from him that I mentioned on my chat with Kyle yesterday, where ideally you want to find a situation where there's low risk, but high uncertainty. And some investors sort right. of mix, mix the two up where it's low risk, where 
in essentially any scenario, you're not going to be losing money, but it's, it, sorry, I said low uncertainty. I meant high uncertainty. So low yeah. risk and high uncertainty. So low risk means your odds are you're not going to lose money on the bet. But the high uncertainty is, is like what exactly plays out in the future. Yeah. Um, Wall Street I, hates uncertainty. Uh, they love yeah. like, you know, constant, constant earnings. But if, if things are choppy or things are uncertain or um, there's just sort of maybe a sketchy part of the business where you don't really know what's going to happen, um, that's like creates sort of the ideal scenario for an investor. Yeah, I think he calls that like in the Dondo investor, I th he, call, he talks about heads I win, tails I don't lose too much. Right. <laughs> that's right. how he tries to stack the odds in his favor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, big fan of Monish. Yeah, he's a big cloner too of Warren and Charlie and their partnership. And the I think the inspiring thing about Monish, one of the many things, but like he really came to investing kind of late, later in life, I think. I, mm -hmm. you know, he, I don't know what age, but he was reading a one up on Wall Street, picked it up in an airport when he was, you know, late 20s maybe or something like that. So yeah, pretty mm -hmm. interesting. So we got Chris Mayer, we got Monish on the plane next to you, who you mentioned and somebody else. Uh, those are the two are definitely top of mind. Um, but when I when I kind of described how I like to invest, usually I just point to Chris Mayer, uh, Charlie Munger, and Nick Sleep, or the people I sort of try to invest like. Just a big focus on quality and a big focus on long term compounding. Let's talk a little bit about Nick Sleep. That's a name that a lot of people may not know um, in our little community. Like we we know who Nick Sleep is, but I forget, I think he's chapter four of William's book, um, Nick and Zach's Excellent Adventure, it's called. Great, interesting guy. Talk to us a little bit about Nick Sleep and what you've, what you've learned from him. Yeah, one of my early episodes on We Study Billionaires was actually uh, talking all about Nick Sleep, and it was one of the more popular ones I've done. But William's chapter on Nick Sleep is probably the chapter I've revisited most in that book. Mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's for in re for reasons that aren't real investment related, which is sort yeah. of ca counterintuitive. Um, mm -hmm. In the mastermind community that I run, occasionally we talk about books that we've read. And yeah. I was in Telluride, Colorado with a group and we were in a bookstore in Telluride. And I, I was walking and I see this book by Robert Persig, Zen and uh -huh. the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And that's like yeah. probably the at least the fifth time I've come across it. Like it's in that chapter on Nick Sleep. It's in yep. Nick Sleep's letters. And it it kept coming up. So I'm like, okay, I see it. I, I finally see the book in person. Like I never go to a bookstore, uh, yeah. these physical bookstores with Amazon right. nowadays. But I see this book and I'm like, okay, I have to buy it. And then um, I set up I set up a chat with the community to like um, see if there was interest. There was a bunch of people interested in reading it because they all know Nick Sleep. And really it's this, this obsession with quality that mm -hmm. I just, I just find so interesting. Um, there, there's this line from Zen in the art, art of motorcycle maintenance it's, that William also pulled in his book where it's essentially they say whether you're, you know, mending a dress, whether you're uh, sharpening a knife, whether you're, you know, creating a podcast, there's a high quality, mm -hmm beautiful way of doing it is the way he puts it. And there's a yeah. low quality, uh, well, let's just say not so good way of doing it. And quality, it's something where you can't really uh, explain what it is, but you know it when you see it. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in that book, they talk about how uh, this guy's in a classroom and he has like a high quality paper and a low quality paper. And uh, without saying like, which is good or which is bad, he just has everyone look at it or read through it and just like describe, uh, whether, you know, what sort of grade they, they'd give it. And everyone essentially agrees what the high quality paper is. So mm -hmm. people, it's hard for people to explain what a high quality business is, what a high quality podcast is, but you know it when you see it. And I just, I just find that so interesting. And uh, one of the sort of filters that I've found to be sort of like a mental model to use in life is to like in business, a lot of times people might think, you know, what's going to maximize like profits or what's going to maximize profits or revenue for 2024. But right. that that's that can be a pretty difficult question and it can actually lead you to making some poor decisions, you know, like short term decisions. 
But uh, I think like if I were Nick Sleep, I would ask myself, what is the high quality decision? You know, mm -hmm. that 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 can make uh, making your decision making process a lot easier. And I found that uh, really helpful in making decisions, whether it be uh, through the podcast and whatnot. You know, you and I, we can bring on, you know, the biggest perma bear and, you know, put, put like a clickbait title and get a lot of downloads. But is that the high quality yeah. decision that's going to work out? Uh, for us in long term and like make us a sustainable business um, i would say right. no personally but yeah. uh yeah that's that's one of my big takeaways from nick sleep but also just like the focus on quality when it comes to uh business business selection for like my own portfolio um it can be tempting to buy something that's low quality that's a cigar bud trading mm -hmm. well below liquidation value but uh yeah they um, stay that way for a long time right <laughs> yeah, yeah, they could. They could stay that way for a long time. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I sleep better at night uh, owning high quality businesses and Nick Sleep helped me uh, lean that direction over time. Yeah, that brings up this idea that he's got a really concentrated portfolio. Can you talk a little bit about that and just how you think about his strategy? Because it does go a little against the grain of what most people would t think about and how to structure a portfolio and diversifying. Right. Yeah. So Nick Sleep, for those who aren't familiar, he started out sort of as a Ben Graham style investor yeah. and he owned some quality businesses. But over time, uh, when he, I can't remember the exact years he ran, it was like, oh man, it was around 2000 to 2014, 2001 to 2014. I think it was a 13 year I think that's right. Year. Yeah. So that's about right. So when he shut it down, everyone was upset because of all the great returns he had, yeah. but he just told them, just put all your money in Berkshire, <laughs> Amazon and Costco, and just don't even touch it. Don't even look at it. And mm -hmm. in hindsight, that was a really good decision. And Stig and I talked about this, uh, with our community actually. And, uh -huh. um, you know, it's easy to say like, Oh, what a genius for, uh, picking these three companies and, you know, just leaving it alone and look how well it worked out. But I'm sure there's a, a plenty of other uh, very smart people, brilliant minds that could have done the same thing for th with three other companies and it just turned out terrible. So there's certainly some selection and sur survivorship bias when you're looking at that. Um, so <laughs> I do like uh, concentration when it comes to investing uh, for me perso personally, but three holdings uh, might be going over overboard. But it's probably also worth mentioning that Berkshire Hathaway isn't really one company. Uh, yes, it right. is one stock, but it, it they own hundreds of companies. And then Amazon. Same with Amazon. Yeah, they're pretty heavily relying on e-commerce, but they also have AWS. They have all these other bets that, you know, in 10 years, they might have all these businesses that don't even exist today. And mm -hmm. they also have all these uh, businesses under there. It's, it's, it's like a conglomerate to some degree. Yeah, yeah and then Costco, um, obviously, it just has their one. Uh, retail business model. Yeah. But uh, I, I asked Chris Mayer about uh, his, his thoughts on concentration. He owns ten, what was 10 stocks. He got a spinoff from Constellation. So I think it's 11 now. Uh -huh. But um, I think his general idea is that great ideas are rare. And right. when he finds them, he really wants to make them count. So um, when he owns 10 names instead of 30 names, he knows the 10 names uh, really, really well. Um, he's pretty confident that permanent capital impairment in any of the names is pretty, pretty low. The chance of that, that's just because mm -hmm. of little to no debt. Um, they produce a lot of cash, um, cash flows generally tend to increase year after year. And, um, there's diminishing returns on, on concentration at a certain point. I think at 10 or 11 stocks, you're getting like 80% of the benefits of diversification. So it mm -hmm. seems pretty concentrated, but you're still getting a lot of the benefits of diversification. And then Chris, uh, with his portfolio, he owns a lot of serial acquirers and yep. some of these you know, like Constellation Software, for example, owns well over six or 700 uh, small businesses. So it's not like there's one or two right. businesses and the whole thing goes down. It's They're very well di diversified and they're becoming more diversified uh, every every single year. So that's quite an interesting aspect where uh, people might overlook uh, how one holding might add a lot more diversification than yeah. uh, another holding. 
Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a good way to look at it. I an, another interesting stat that I heard listening, you know, researching for our interview is the stat that you and Stig talked about that there's there's only four percent of equities, and I don't know what the time frame was, like outperform treasuries, which mm -hmm. kind of blew my mind. You think like equities, you know, outperform treasuries by and large, you know, like, so th that was pretty wild for me to hear that that stat of only 4% of equities just outperform a simple treasury investment. Yeah. Uh, that that's honestly a pretty daunting statistic, It is, but, uh, <laughs> I think what I would say to that or why I would justify thinking, you know, I could do well, you know, picking individual stocks is one that that studies over like an 80 or 90 year time frame. Okay. Um, I, I mentioned that stat from Morgan Housel, 40% of companies over a 30, 34 year period uh, lost all their value. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the 4% stat, when you look out over 80 or 90 years, that doesn't really surprise me that much um, yeah. because industries and businesses change so much over that period. And, you know, hopefully with the businesses I own, you know, I'm owning them, at least five, 10 plus years, but you know, I'm monitoring, are the businesses continuing to grow? Are the KPIs like, um, if, if I own Costco, for example, like, are they continuing to open new stores over a year? What do their sales per store look like over, 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 over time? And, you know, once you see those start to decline or sort of stagnate, then it might be time to sort of move on and, you know, find something else that, you know, isn't in the stagnation or right. in, in the process of, of dying. Um, and what I'd also say is that certain stocks are just going to produce better returns over time. So companies that are highly levered, like eventually they're probably going to get themselves into trouble or companies that are in cyclical in industries, those tend to not have great returns over time. So I think once you filter out some of these, you know, some of these characteristics of businesses or characteristics of industries or unprofitable companies, like I'm not going to. I just don't really bother with unprofitable yeah. companies and you know, right. those tend to not have great returns over time. So I think once you filter out some of those, the statistic might not be quite as daunting, but uh, yeah. I haven't actually ran through the names. Yeah. Yeah. No, it surprised me when I heard that. And like you said, it is a little daunting to think about. I wanted to jump back to Nick's sleep and touch on one idea. He has the, he had this idea of like an X number where it was like, once he hit a certain number i don't know exactly what it was in net worth he was going to shut things down and retire and and pursue what he called higher pursuits which was philanthropy for him and you know i i'm sure he, he was doing he, i think he races cars and things like that but um is that something you think about in your own life like do you have like an x number that uh that once you hit hit i in my mind it's like investing is a game right and so he just stopped the game once he hit the, hit that number to some degree, right? He he, I'm sure you know he obviously manages his own portfolio, but like to just stop doing something that you love and are really great at, like you know you talked talked about the Robert Piercek book, you know he's a high quality investor. Is that something in your own life? Like you think about like if you were to hit X number, you just stop and go pursue. I don't know, like go help whatever cause you're inter most interested in. Yeah, I've thought about uh, what my goal is generally as an investor. And I think my answer to that question would be, you know, compound capital at a high rate without, you know, blowing up the whole thing. So like without taking excess risk. So like, yeah. you know, achieve as high as returns I can um, without you know, experiencing substantial downside. So protecting for the downside as well. And I kind of picked that up from Chris Mayer. And then another sort of goal that ties into that is like, you know, I want to become financially independent. Mm -hmm. And your your point about, uh, you know, hitting that number, you know, I don't really have a number in terms of, you know, I, once I hit this point, I'm, I'm financially independent. It's like generally um, life situations just changes so much. Sure. You know, I'm still right. in my 20s right now and who knows yeah. what my life or priorities are going to be when I'm 35 or 40. And I think um, it's similar to when I was an actuary where like, you know, I wasn't really spending a ton of money or buying things I didn't really need. Mm -hmm. uh, 
those decisions really set me up to transition to TIB because, you know, it allowed me to uh, take an initial pay cut and it allowed me to uh, take the risk of, you know, trying a whole new field. Whereas if I had, if I was strapped to like a giant mortgage and giant car payment, like that would have been impossible to do. So that's the way I sort of think about it is just like, you know, try and put myself in a better financial position to where I have the optionality to pursue yep. the sort of things I want. Uh, Nick Sleep discovered what he wanted to pursue uh, after mm -hmm. his investing uh, journey was was over. And uh, yeah, I think that's amazing, amazing for him to have the the you know, the willingness to venture into something new once his identity was like this great investor. Um, right. So, yeah. Um, I, I don't, I have no idea, honestly, what my life's going to look like five or 10 years from now, but, uh, yeah. uh, you know, hopefully I'm in a position where, um, just, just being a host of TIP has just opened me up to just all these different opportunities of meeting various people, of mm -hmm. being introduced to all these different types of investors. So you really know, you, you really never know where the world's going to lead you. So yeah, yeah, I'm reminded of the the Steve Jobs quote of you can't really, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You, you can only do it looking exactly. backwards. And yeah. I, I absolutely love that because um, when it, even in joining TIP, I could have never imagined, you know, being in the position I'm in now, but you know, looking back, it totally makes sense where, yeah. you know, now I do, we study billionaires. Now I help run an investment community and it's just opened up more and more uh, opportunities for me. And uh, it it's also reminds me of Morgan Housel, the quote I mentioned where, uh, the biggest event over the next 10 years is going to be something you can't even imagine. I'm sure there's going to be yeah. something that happens within the next few years where I just can't even imagine it. And then in, in hindsight, it's just, just going to look, you know, so obvious of because course. of that right. hindsight <laughs> bias. Yeah. So you mentioned the, the mastermind community and I wanted to touch on that a little bit. I, I don't, I know a little bit about it, but I wanted to learn uh, more about what you and Kyle are up to. Wanted to hear about the impetus for it and just how it's been going so far for you. Yeah. So Stig and I, in 2023, we put together these free events in Omaha in 2023 um, during the Berkshire weekend. And we had room for, I don't know, something like 150 people each time. It, it depends what, what location we were at. We had a number of free events just, just for people in the TIP audience to come hang out with us and have some fun and uh, just socialize with the, the whole TIP community. And as I was organizing this, getting emails, getting constant messages from people, I was just really, well, pretty quickly, like Stig and I talked about it like in November. So like six months before Omaha. And then like, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's by like December or January, I realized like, hey, if we let any more people sign up for this, we're literally not going to have room for people to join us. And I don't, the last right. thing I want is like just a total madhouse. So I just like mm -hmm. shut down the forum, like, no one else can sign up because we already have like 250 people who are interested and in like, you know, if two thirds of them show up, we're pretty much full. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> I got to thinking, why are so many people wanting to attend this live event that we're hosting? You know, there's like so much interest. Like usually you'd think like, oh, people hear about it in Omaha and they just go and show up. But it was like five or six months beforehand, like people are reaching out to me constantly like, hey, are you going <laughs> to let us attend this event? And it really got me thinking, why, why is that happening? And I sort of came to the conclusion that like, people aren't just going to Omaha just to see Buffett and Munger and then call it a weekend. They're really wanting to get to know and network with people who are like minded to them. And as a list, when I go back to when I, I was a listener of the show, um, you know, I sort of had these internal conversations, like listening to Preston and Stig and listening to their, uh, their mastermind discussions, like pitching stocks, but I never got to talk, like I would try to talk about that with my friends, but you know, it, it just never clicked with them. They just weren't interested in it. They don't really understand it. And it, it's just, if you're not interested in it, you're not interested in it. It's, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's why people were so interested in, you know, getting together, uh, and having that opportunity to talk with like-minded people and plus you know so many of these people are from outside the u.s like i just had someone email me the other day that's coming from australia to come to omaha oh. and people you know i know come from asia europe like everywhere in the world 
So I'm like, okay, what if we created something where we create a place that people can connect with like-minded uh, investors, but it's not just one week into the year, it's the entire year. So mm -hmm. that was really the start of the TIP mastermind community. And we ended up launching it the month of our events so we could tell people to talk about it to people at the events. And then uh, I ended up meeting some of the people that joined right away in Omaha, which was, you know, quite interesting where I already met like 10 or 15 people that were already joined our community uh, just two weeks after launching it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's really a place to network with like minded people online. A lot of people hop on calls one on one. We have uh, around 100 members right now and we plan on capping it at 150. And it's a place to uh, share stock ideas, get new ideas from others. Um, we have people apply to join. So really, there's a filter that goes through where you we have to make sure you're a like minded person, you kind of think pretty similar uh, in terms of investing, you know, trying to buy something for less than it's worth, understanding moats, understanding intrinsic value, just basic things like that. Mm -hmm. And really, it's a wide range of people. Like some people are earlier on in their journey. Some people are work in the investment industry. And then people also seem to really like uh, we bring in special guests that uh, have been on the podcast. So we've had Chris Mayer join us, Gotham Bade, uh, Ian Castle, Tobias Carlisle. Um, yeah, so we have various people come in and, and chat with us. And then we also do educational type stuff. Kyle does some write ups. And then we also do. Two, we're going to be hosting two live events a year specific for the community. So we'll be doing two social hours in Omaha in May. And then <clears throat> I plan on also hosting a, a live event in New York City in the fall. So cool. that, that was the impetus and kind of what we're up to. That's awesome. Have you gotten any feedback from members and like some of the benefits, like just what, what the feedback is and benefits like that they talk about? Yeah. So since the community offers sort of a lot of different value, you know, values in the eye, I've sure. kind of learned that over time that values in the eye of the beholder, uh, what yeah. one person sees valuable, another person doesn't see any value in it at all. So yeah. the, the three main benefits I sort of see is just having a network to run ideas by or a network to sort of uh, expose yourself to. Um, mm -hmm. online, there's people constantly posting different things or just sharing books or reading articles they read. Uh, so just being a part of that network, um, really is invaluable. It just exposes, exposes you to a lot of serendipity of, you never know what sort of connection is going to pop up, or maybe you're traveling to a city and, uh, you know, a person in the community that lives there. So mm -hmm. you you, get access to just, just this amazing network. A lot of them are entrepreneurs or they've sold businesses. So, yeah. uh, just amazing people in general, not just like uh, having that investment mindset, but they have yeah. a lot of life experiences that, um, in my opinion, is just invaluable. And then, um, a lot of people join just to get new stock ideas or to share their ideas with others. It's, it, this definitely isn't an, an investment service. So, um, I don't encourage anyone to join just to like, Hey, go and buy this stock. Right. Um, really it's an, it can be a place for idea generation. And then, um, people also really seem to like the special guests that we bring in. So just, uh, being able to ask just these experts that you wouldn't otherwise have access to uh, seems to be really valuable and people really like to. So tell me a little bit about like what it costs, how often you guys meet, a um, little, little bit about how it's structured. Yeah, right now the cost is one ninety seven a month or multiply that 10 for the yearly. So 1970 for the year. 70. Yeah. Got to do a live math here. <laughs> Public and math then, is um, hard. <laughs> yeah, so that's the cost. We do a we try to do a live Zoom event every week. Uh, the time of day we do that just depends on you know we're working with various people's schedules. We do social hours and work with people's schedules. So generally every week, uh, a lot of times we do more than one a week, and then all those get recorded because people our members just live busy lives. So we record yeah. everything. You know, not everyone can sit in at a specific time with this right. Q and A. So it's also nice because because we're building a huge backlog of content for the community. And, you know, someone joins today, they have access to every single recording we've done since April oh, that's awesome. 2023. So it's been close to a year. And then, uh, yeah, so online, we're meeting once a week, essentially, and then 
uh, live events, you get access to Omaha and New York City if you're interested in meeting up in person. And I, one of the other things I wanted to mention about uh, Omaha in 2023 is it just felt like uh, since there were so many people there, um, I really didn't know who was showing up generally. Uh, I found that the conversations were just really surface level for me personally. Mm -hmm. So it's like, mm -hmm. I really didn't get to really know people. And I'm just talking to so many people as well, like 50 plus people, you know, introducing themselves. So it's hard to get past that sort of surface level. And yeah. um, when you have a small community where, you know, 30 of the hundred members are going to Omaha, like, you know, who's going to be going, you can see we have, we have like a registration list. So you can see who's going to be going and you're like, okay, I want to talk to these three people. I want to yep. get insights from this person on this company. So it really is a, an amazing way to get past the surface level and really mm -hmm. build those deeper relationships, uh, which is, uh, for me personally, just like the relationships part of being a part yeah. of this has just been amazing. Just meeting so many amazing people and, um, yeah, like now I know, for example, like whenever I go to New York City, I have plenty of friends to go and see and uh, people to go hang out with. And uh, yeah, for me, I, that just uh, is a huge, huge benefit. Yeah, it sounds like a really great thing. Like what Khaled mentioned, like in our day to day lives, there's not that many people that really want to talk about what we're into, what, whatever it is, you know, podcasting or investing, you know, it's kind of a niche topic. And so it's really hard to find a community. So this is, you know, sounds like an awesome thing to be, to be a part of you, you would, I want to switch gears. You had mentioned got him bade and that he, he was part of the mastermind community. I did a Twitter thread. I think actually went by your suggestion, uh, that did really well. It was one of my best performing threads. And I know that you did a series on his book, joys of compounding. That was, was one of your best performing series. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the joys of compounding. I know it's an important book for you. What do you think it is? It just strikes a chord about that book with listeners and readers. Yeah, there's a funny story kind of behind that book. Uh, I talk with various people on Twitter. I was DMing compounding quality. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I asked him for book recommendations or what, but he messaged me. He, he must have just messaged me and said, hey, by the way, uh, if you haven't read The Joys of Compounding, I highly recommend it. It he, he said it was uh, as good as William's book. And wow. when I heard that, I was just like, there's no way. Like, I was pretty yeah. skeptical. And uh, <clears throat> I bought the book. And honestly, this, like, right when I started reading it, I was just like blown away. Mm -hmm. And shortly after I had a meeting with Stig and I was talking to Stig, I was like, I've been doing these book reviews and each book has been like one episode, like one one hour episode. And mm -hmm. I'm going through this book. I'm like, I can't do all this in one episode. I'm like, <laughs> I'm telling Stig, I could probably do five or six episodes on this one book. And mm -hmm. Stig was like, wow. Like he had never read the book. <laughs> and he was like, if, if that's true, then, then go ahead, do that. So I, I'm pretty sure I did a five-part series mm -hmm. that was in the first half of 2023, sort of April, May timeframe. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so I reviewed the book. And the reason I think it, sort of struck a chord is that I think it really encapsulates everything uh, the value investing community stands for and everything that TIP stands for and what we're all about. You know, he just pulled all these key lessons for, um, you know, just like lifelong learning, like what's most important when it comes to value investing. Like a lot of these ideas weren't like something he came up with. Like he had read just countless books, like yeah. <laughs> countless books. He's read, you know, everything Buffett talks about. He read all the sh Buffett shareholder letters. He, he went through everything and mm -hmm. he just put together all together in one book. And, uh, you know, half of it, I would say is just like general things with regards to life, like how to, yeah. uh, you know, approach life in a way that's like honorable and ethical. And mm -hmm. I just thought that was so interesting and just lifelong learning. And uh, a lot of it also is about investing too. And each chapter is sort of standalone to some degree because it's all just about one sort of topic. Like there's a chapter on incentives that I've, I've looked back on so many times and he pulls in all these amazing quotes in, in regards to, to what he's talking about. And um, I've, I've just never found one resource that's quite like it and never really came across uh, anything that... <clears throat> 
really hits on all the value investing topics. It's what we've talked about for years. And he just put it all into to one resource. And um, I, I, I love the book personally. Yeah, I do too. You had a chance to interview him. What was that like? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I had him on the show twice, actually. Uh, he released his second book, The Making of a Value Investor, late 2023. So I brought him on for that too. Um, but really, yeah, from chatting with him and reading his book, some of the big takeaways for me was just, again, the appreciation for high quality businesses and why they work. Um, mm -hmm. One of the most difficult parts of investing is the qualitative aspects. Like as a numbers guy, um, you, I sort of got attracted to investing because of the numbers, but really what makes it sort of interesting is these qualitative aspects, things like people, culture, industry dynamics, like competitive, uh, competitive dynamics, just how, how businesses fit into the bigger picture of the world. And, um, he really opened my eyes up to why and how people tend to underestimate the value of high quality businesses and, uh, people can, can get fixated on the numbers. They get fixated on a PE ratio or whatnot without understanding the big picture of where a company is heading over the long run. And um, he talks about uh, Terry Smith is like a very popular quality investor. And he talks about, uh, you know, how people get fixated on these PE ratios. But um, and I think it's another way some people can get duped into buying lower quality businesses and earning lower returns as a result of it. And uh, I think uh, when you look, zoom out over like a 10 plus year time horizon and you have a great business, it doesn't really matter if you bought it at a multiple of 20 or 40. All that matters really is that you bought it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also liked how Gautam talked about how he talked about this concept of quality increasing your margin of safety. Uh, because great businesses increase their intrinsic value over time. So, um, you know, with each passing day, the intrinsic value is going up over time, essentially because the earnings are continued to march upward. And I also loved that he mentioned the example of Ben Graham. He was a cigar butt investor. He's, that's what he's known for. But he made the majority of his money owning Geico stock. Right. <laughs> it's just, just like so ironic how this, this one business, he happened to buy it and I can't remember exactly why he ended up holding on to it uh, for like 30, 40 years, but that made him more money than by far than anything else. That's where he made the majority of his money. And uh, there's this Ben Graham. He talks a lot about this idea of mean reversion. Great companies eventually become average and poor companies mm -hmm. eventually become uh, average. So things sort of mean revert over time. And uh, Gautam shared this study in his book that's really stuck with me where it's, it was from Credit Suisse. And essentially, it, it showed that over successive five-year periods, it ends up that great businesses tend to remain great and poor businesses tend to remain poor. And it kind of gave mm -hmm. me the peace of mind of, okay, maybe when you reference that 4% study, over a 90-year period, maybe a great business turns into a zero. But over, over these sort of shorter timeframes that we can really sort of deal with and grapple with. Like, I don't know what a business is going gonna, is gonna to look like 50 plus years in the future, but I can operate in sort of a three to five year time horizon and then continually reassess is a sort, mm -hmm. sort of the way I view it. And uh, yeah, Gautam also uh, helped me appreciate uh, quality in a business and the power that holds uh, for investors. Yeah, it's a great book. That Joys of Compounding and Richer, Wiser, Happier are two of my favorites that uh, I think everybody should own and everybody, you know, could reread every year and get some, some value out of it. Something new, you know, that, that, yeah, it's just, there's two, two great books. I wanted to kind of wrap up here and ask you there, we, we talked about Morgan Housel's book, The Psychology of Money, and then his, his second book, Same as Ever. My favorite chapter of Psychology of Money is called Confessions where we get a peek into how like Morgan runs his own financial life and look, get a look under the hood of like his portfolio. There's a quote, I think that's attributed to Monish Pabrai that goes along the lines of, I don't want to hear what you think. I want to know what's in your portfolio. Show me your portfolio. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that and hear about your own portfolio and how you've got it structured. Yeah. So 
one of my bigger holdings is actually Bitcoin, which I never talk about on the show. And um, you and I were talking, I, I kind of went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole in 2020, uh, read the Bitcoin standard, uh, saw the transition Preston was making with NTIP. And mm -hmm. yes, ever since 2020, I've just bought it and held it and added to it over time. Um, you know, it's a long term bet for me and I don't really uh, care too much what it does in the short term or whether an ETF is going to uh, dramatically increase the price or right now it's falling. It's not <laughs> um, in light of the ETF. But yeah, I mean, for me, it's just a long term holding and, you know, it's gone up and become a bigger <clears throat> part of my portfolio. But uh, personally, what I find a lot more interesting right now is just in talking about and researching all these individual companies uh, and talking about stock investing on the podcast. So mm -hmm. actually own right now, I only own six individual stocks. Um, the most recent one I actually covered on the show with Kyle was Dino Polska, uh, mm -hmm. the retail, the grocer out of Poland. Yeah. Um, so we have an episode on that if anyone wants to learn more about it. And then uh, we are actually just recorded about Evolution AB. That's one of my mm -hmm. other bigger mm -hmm. stock holdings. Uh, that that company is out of Sweden. Uh, really growing quite fast and it's quite an interesting name. And I, and I think it has a lot of room to run and uh, has, what do really they do? Tell a, me a little bit more about Evolution AB. Yes. And yes. our listeners who don't know. Yeah, usually I just refer to them as Evolution. But if you look it up, Evolution AB is what they go under. And there's a there's the main ticker is EVO. That's the one I own on Interactive Brokers. But then there's also a ADR. Uh, so you can I think you can get access to it uh, on a regular investment account. Uh, it's EVVTY, I think is the ticker on that. But Evolution essentially is a, they develop online games. So like live, okay. live games. So they're yeah. capitalizing on this trend from land-based casinos to online. So mm -hmm. uh, right now, land-based casinos are sort of in a decline. And globally, the online casino market is just, and it's, it's in a structural growth trend. I think from 2018 to 2022, that market's grown by 21% per year. And evolution in some of those years has grown by over 50% their revenue. Mm -hmm. And uh, what they specialize in is live casinos. So you can think about blackjack or roulette where you actually have a live dealer and people get online and they see the live dealer. And it's really a difficult business model for uh, these a lot of these casinos or other oper operators to get in because scale is so, so important. It's so costly to set up these tables and reach the scale. And that's... Yeah. Evolution is what they've specialized in, and there's really no other strong competitors that there are a lot of competitors, but there's no one that operates at the scale they do or has just the vast amount of games that they do. Just in 2023 alone, they've developed over 100 games. So they, they create these new games. And um, another tailwind they sort of have behind their back is they, uh, the regulation of iGaming globally. So as more and more of these countries uh, develop regulations, the market continues to mature and continue to grow. Europe is their mature market. Uh, I believe they're still growing in the teens uh, in Europe. But when you look at Asia and Latin America, the growth is like really strong for evolution. So one of the things I like about it is that it's global and they have a strong market position in what they do and it's global and they're growing in all these different markets like I don't know which markets they're going to do the best in over the next five, 10 years, but I can see like overall big picture, like yeah. they're capturing a lot of this uh, massive market. But uh, yeah, Kyle and I will have an episode going out actually in early February on this company. Um, if anyone's interested in learning more, we, we did a hour plus long deep dive on it. <clears throat> and then uh, back to my portfolio, I also own uh, some index funds in cash because I'd like to bring my individual holdings close to 10, uh, hopefully in, within the next year or two, just kind of gradually making my way towards that number. Kind of cloning uh, Chris, Chris Mayer a little yeah. bit. Yeah. yeah. A, a number I can sort of grapple with in terms of actually knowing the companies and tracking them, uh, you know, but not too much where it's becomes overwhelming and I'm kind of losing, uh, the be benefits of adding more. So yeah, that's where I'm at right now. So percentage wise, how would you break it down? I'm sure if you got into Bitcoin, whenever, that's become a bigger part of your portfolio. But how, how do you think about breaking it down in term percentage wise, individual stocks, Bitcoin index funds? Yeah. 
honestly, I'd rather not share percentages. Okay, like that's the fine. Bitcoin's grown yeah. to be a sizable part, but um, you know, I think of it more in terms of my cost basis and. Um, I'm a big fan of just letting winners run. So, you know, yeah. Bitcoin might stagnate for quite some time or might come down. But uh, yeah. And then, uh, you know, as like, as I continue to save more and more money, um, you know, depending on where things move and how things change, then I can allocate, you know, where I'm allocating new cash uh, accordingly right. too. Yeah. I wanted to touch a little bit on volatility, not Bitcoin only. Bitcoin's obviously volatile, but also individual stocks. Like, how how do you deal with that from like a psychological standpoint? It, it's pretty tough weathering some of those ups and downs. Is it a matter of conviction for you, or how do you how do you deal with the volatility? Yeah, I think uh, Bitcoin's actually a great example for thinking about volatility, just because it's the most volatile thing <laughs> people know about, unless they've got into uh, very speculative <laughs> things that, um, you know, like a, a lot of gross stocks, a lot of all coins type type stuff. But one of the realizations I've sort of come to in recent years is that the market isn't the market price is not driven by the average person participating in that market. For example, mm -hmm. uh, in Bitcoin, over ninety per, or over seventy or seventy five percent of the coins haven't moved in the past year, which tells me the majority of people that own Bitcoin think it's going to be a higher price uh, one, two, three, four years into the future. But mm -hmm. if you have an FTX type player coming in, it sort of makes you realize that just a few players in a market can really move the price like significantly. Right. Like you could say FTX alone brought it from 30 or 40 to below 20, just like that oh, yeah. one. Yeah. And then it, there's contagion as well, where other players get get liquidated there's all these leveraged traders and i think mm -hmm. it it also ties into the point that a market has like an infinite number of different types of investors that are buying and selling for totally different reasons mm -hmm. so i think it's really important for me personally to know why i'm buying it like what my time horizon is and what my thesis is in owning that and uh you can think about like an example like berkshire hathaway where people the average person owning berkshire might say it's undervalued but mm -hmm. people don't buy and sell just based on whether it's undervalued or overvalued like some people might be selling it to go and buy a home where they aren't mm -hmm. even looking at the intrinsic value or the market value of it they, they need cash so they need to sell and to do that um, some investors might sell it because uh, they found a better opportunity um, they know berkshire is undervalued but maybe they go and found find another company that's more undervalued. Um, so just just that realization that there's so many different players in the market, there's so many short term people that think short term or just think irrationally. Um, it points to like the markets of voting machine in the short term and the weighing machine in the long term. So, right. you know, really what to me, like I care about the fundamentals and like the, the price is really noise for the most part in the mm -hmm. short term. Um, unless you're, unless your thesis is of course busted and whatever it is you own. So I think the best way to manage volatility is definitely understanding what you own, why you own it, and then adjust your position size accordingly. So, um, if you can't sleep at night, then that might be an indication you might need to <laughs> scale back yeah. on a holding, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's something wrong in terms of your understanding of it why it is you own it and maybe your position size isn't, isn't, uh, you know, in line with, with, with your understanding of it. Yeah. So once something goes into your portfolio, whether it's Bitcoin or these individual stocks, equities that you own, is it pretty much your mindset? It's a long-term hold. Oh yeah. 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 Uh, okay. yeah. I mean, I used to like, I remember buying some of the big tech names during the drawdown in 22. Um, but once those reverted back, I ended up allocating them to uh, things I thought were better opportunities. But yeah, ideally, when I own something, I'm hopefully going to own it for uh, at least three or five years plus, and then sort of reevaluate over time. Give it, give it sort of a leash to you know some. Com all companies go through some growing pains, and you know give them a chance to to come back. But yeah, definitely uh, want those longer term plays because I think the that's where a lot of the gains are going to be uh, for my portfolio.
Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. I think it's interesting to our listeners to just hear individually, like how you personally invest and I appreciate you sharing that. So this is a good place to put a pin in things. I really appreciate your time. Was there anything that we didn't get a chance to talk about that you maybe wanted to mention? I don't think so. We hit on a lot. Yeah, we covered a lot. So before we sign off, how can our listeners find out more about you, get in touch with you, maybe learn about the mastermind community, things like that? Yeah, I'm on Twitter at Clay underscore Fink is my username, F-I-N-C-K. The podcast is We Study Billionaires. Um, many listeners probably know what that is. And then uh, the mastermind community, uh, you can just search TIP mastermind community on Google or uh, go to theinvestorspodcast.com slash mastermind. Awesome. Clay, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it and had a fun time. Thanks, Patrick. Really enjoyed it. When 2020 happened, just like you did, we had you know um, lots of time on our hands and I spent a lot of that time studying, investing, um, studying all the usual suspects, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, um, and reading and reading and reading and, and really going down the rabbit hole of value investing. And I found out I loved it.